and our beautiful world, and uh, we decided to end with our own faith, Christianity. And last week, uh, we, we spent an excellent study on the incarnation of Jesus Christ and what, what the incarnation means in the Christian faith. Um, and uh, Father Bill assigned me the crucifixion. And so um, when uh, Pastor Joyce and Father Bill and I were meeting a couple of weeks ago, I said to Bill, I said, well, okay, what are the seminal texts that I need to look at? What are, what are, which church father do I go to and find out all about crucifixion? You know, give me the list right now so I can, I can know what to do and what's the smart thing to say and so on. And he looked at me and he said, no, Manisha, I want you to tell us about what crucifixion means to you. Oh, my goodness. What does a crucifixion mean to me? So what you have in front of you is, is not a doctoral thesis of any sort. It's not, um, it's not even academic. Um, but it's simply uh, my frequently asked questions about God crucified. So you have the questions that I always ask when I'm encountering the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And what I'd love to do is um, go through this with you and then invite you to offer the questions that you always ask or that you tend to ask when you think about Jesus Christ crucified, that God came to earth and was killed. Um, and what does that mean to you? So I thought we'd start with a poem because the crucifixion, of course, is um, sometimes beyond words. Um, we use words to try to engage with this act, but um, there have been a lot of poet, poems written about it, and this is one of the ones that I like. It's called The Killing by Edwin Muir Scott. That was the day they killed the Son of God on a squat hill topped by Jerusalem. Zion was there, her children from their maze sucked by the dream of curiosity leaning through the gates, the very halt and blind had somehow got themselves up to the hill. After the ceremonial preparation, the scourging, nailing, nailing against the wood, erection of the main trees with their burden, while from the hill rose an orchestral wailing, they were there at last, high up, in the soft spring day, we watched the writhings, heard the moanings, saw the three heads turning on their separate axles like broken wheels left spinning. Round his head was loosely bound a crown of plaited thorn that hurt at random, stinging temple and brow as the pain swung into its envious circle. In front, the wreath was gathered in a knot that, as he gazed, looked like the last stump left of a death, wounded deer's great antlers. Some who came to stare grew silent as they looked, indignant or sorry. But the hardened old and the hard-hearted young, although at odds from the first morning, cursed him with having prayed for a rabbi or an armed messiah and found the son of God. What use to them was a God or a son of God? What avail for purposes such as theirs beside the cross foot alone for women stood and did not move all day? The sun revolved, the shadows wheeled, the evening fell. His head lay on his breast, but in his breast they watched his heart move on by itself, alone, accomplishing its journey. Their taunts grew louder, sharpened by the knowledge that he was walking in the park of death, far from their rage, yet all grew stale at last, spite, curiosity, envy, 
hate itself. They waited only for death, and death was slow, and came so quietly they scarce could mark it. They were angry then with death and death's deceit. I was a stranger, could not read these people or this outlandish deity. Did a god indeed in dying? Cross my life that day, by chance, he on his road and I on mine. One of the first questions that I had to wrestle with when I thought about the crucifixion is why? Why was this so crucial to the faith? Why was Jesus? the Son of God, killed. So I came up with several answers, um, trying to understand this on my own. I had three. And the first was, of course, what we say, um, I think, in, in our Orthodox faith. Jesus was crucified to take away the sins of the world, including my own which was really, really important to me as I encountered the crucifixion. As, as, as I stare at Jesus on the cross, um, I realized that there was something about me that made him go up there. And so um, I always love the Good Friday hymns because they say it in ways that I can. So I offer to you um, that wonderful Good Friday hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus. Ah, Holy Jesus. How hast thou offended that we to judge thee have in hate pretended? By foes derided, by thine own rejected, O oh, most afflicted. Who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason Jesus hath undone thee. Twas I, Lord Jesus, I it was that denied thee. I crucified. So in some ways, Jesus on that cross has everything to do with me. And I don't know if that's how you encounter Jesus on the cross, but um, I, I realize that there's, there has to first be this kind of personal connection before I can go to the place where it becomes bigger than me. I realize that there's something about me that made Jesus willing, want to, and necessary for him to go and be killed. Why is a little bit more tricky, right? And that's when you get into these atonement theories. And one of the most important things that I learned in seminary is um, there are atonement theories, there is no doctrine. And what that means is they can't figure out exactly how this works. They cannot figure out why Jesus going to the cross somehow affects the sins of the world. Um, so there's a lot of theories about this, and probably the one that we know the best is something called the satisfaction theory or the ransom theory. Um, it's kind of a genre where, where it's understood that the sins of the world are against God. And there needs to be some way to to balance the sins of the world. Either God is so holy that he cannot stand to look at the, sin, the sins of the world. It's just impossible. They're incompatible. And so something has to happen so that the sins of the world can be erased or paid for, and that's Jesus on the cross, right? Do you recognize that kind of theology, that vision, sort of? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, another, another vision is that, um, that sin held us in captivity, and somebody had to pay, pay the ransom, right? So it was Jesus, the Lamb of God, who went ahead, paid the cost for us so that we didn't have to. Um, another vision is, is um, one that's uh, a little bit more kind of legalistic. You know, we appear before the judge, before the throne, um, having to give an accounting for all our sins, and instead... Christ comes right in front of us and says, no, no, I'll, I'll take it on. And instead, I'll give them my righteousness, right? So we're 
clothed with an alien righteousness when we appear before the ju before the judge. All those are theories, and and they never really they helped me in one sense, but they they floundered in another because. Um, I don't understand a God who would insist on that kind of rational system, like, you know, if A, then B, you know. If you screw it up, somebody's got to pay. And the reason why I struggle probably most with that is because, um, of course, in my own personal background, I came from that kind of system. Uh, we call it karma. You know, if you did something, there were consequences. So it, it, it really... Um, made me wonder if that's truly what's going on. And again, I was very, very grateful that these are just theories and not doctrine. I'm required to believe them. So um, there are some other uh, wonderful atonement theories, and I know that um, uh, Father Bill will be able to provide you every single one of them. But the one that I found really intriguing is um, by a guy named Rene Girard, and it's called scapegoating. And I don't know if I agree with this either, but I, I like it a little bit better. And scapegoating is this vision that when communities and peoples come together uh, and something goes wrong, they naturally want to blame someone or something or some group. This should sound very familiar to us, right? When something goes wrong, it's somebody's fault. And so we look for a scapegoat. It's how societies... Um, Gather. It's it's how they uh, keep cohesion. Um, in some ways, it's how they create identities um, because they see themselves as different as the other. The other system. So this um, Rene Girard noticed that there was this kind of need for the scapegoating mechanism and a need for what he called collective fratters fratricide against a victim. And he saw this as foundational to all human cultures. Um, so his vision is that Jesus came to the cross and became the ultimate scapegoat. Right? You want to blame anybody? Blame Jesus. Put all the blame on him. And now that he has taken on the blame, you do not need to live find that um, an intriguing concept to think about um, as, as a moral norm for my life. Uh, how many times do I wish to blame somebody <laughs> or something for, for what's going on and uh, learning through the cross that there's no need to live like that anymore. That we are free from finding blame but instead to embrace whatever's going on in life. Um, other thoughts about why Jesus had to be killed, um, number B, because God in Christ experienced the whole human condition, making it all holy and sacred. It's astounding to me that um, God becomes a human being and enters into our life, experiences temptation, experiences all the, the things that I find incredibly human and possibly unholy, and then experiences death. And I don't know about you, but I find incredible comfort in that because I figured out that one day I'm going to die. And I, I mean, like, when I figured that out, I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what's that going to be like? And I have to tell you that being a Christian has made it clear to me that I don't have to be afraid of it because Jesus went through it. It's astounding to me. I am not afraid of death because Jesus Christ has gone through it and I will not be alone when I go through it too. Thank God Jesus The other thing that strikes me about his crucifixion is, um, is the way it happened. 
and the, the, the story of Holy Week, where he speaks out. He's in Jerusalem, the center of power for his time and his people, and he speaks out to the powers and the principalities. He says the truth. And they take him. And he pays the price. I think that understanding that to me makes me understand several things about my own life. But more importantly, where God is when it comes to truth and justice. God will always be present when the truth is spoken, even if you're crucified for it. So I've learned not to see God in places where the power, the powers are, are creating new norms. I have learned to see God when the truth is spoken and there's nothing else behind it. Does that make sense? No. Okay. All right. So that's one of my frequently asked questions about the crucifixion. Why did Jesus have to die? Here's my second one. But the kind of death, so crucifixion itself, was the kind of death significant? Like, you know, um, if Jesus were in the modern day, would he get shot? <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't matter how he died. Um, so, so here are some of the answers that I thought of. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's important because of the, the, the torture, the physical agony that he went through when he was crucified, and the public suffering. So there's a, a, an Episcopal priest named Fleming Rutledge, and she just wrote a book about crucifixion. <laughs> um, and here's what she says. Not even the celebrated film by Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ, could how many of you have seen The Passion of the Christ? Well, only a couple. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I remember when that first came out, like, you know, it was, people would come back to church and they're like, oh my gosh, you have to see this movie, right? And, and so um, I actually went in with a notebook <laughs> because I, 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 was, I was concerned. I was like, you know, is it, is it scriptural? Is it biblical? And everything. And, um, and I was grateful for that notebook because there were some really harrowing scenes um, that were just hard to interact with. And I realized that the, the whole point of the movie was to show this was a horrible way to die. It was disgusting. It was um, demeaning in the most awful of ways. Um, it was terrible. So, um, Fleming Rutledge says, not even this film can convey the full ghastliness of crucifixion to a modern audience. We don't understand it because we have never seen anything like it in the flesh. The situation was very different in New Testament times. Everyone knew what it looked like, smelled like, sounded like. The horrific sight of completely naked men in agony the smell and sight of their bodily functions taking place in full view of all, the sound of their groans and labored breathing going on for hours, and in some cases, days. Um, in, in the International Bible Dictionary or something like that, something that was written a while back, um, when, when you look up crucifixion, they, they define it as such. Um, it's when the wounds swell around the rough nails and the torn and lacerated tendons and nerves cause excruciating agony and the arteries of the head and stomach were surcharged with blood and a terrific throbbing headache ensued and the victim of a crucifixion literally died a thousand deaths and perhaps worst of all, nobody So crucifixion uh, was, was a shameful way to die. It was on purpose, right? Um, it was uh, ways that the Roman government made sure that you understood 
that when you're caught doing whatever it is that the person has been crucified for, uh, you will pay dearly. And uh, and so you know it was it was a form of, of um, prevention, <laughs> of crime prevention. Um, and and you know I don't know what it was like back then, but I imagine that you know everyone realized, oh my gosh, you know I don't ever want to go through that. And so they looked upon the people who've been crucified as being the worst of the worst, and and um, and and having uh, no sense of humanity. Uh, people would often jeer at them, and and uh, we uh, we do hear about the mockery of, of Jesus in, in the Gospels. So um, it definitely was. A terrible, terrible way to die. Um, but there were thousands of people who died from crucifixion. It wasn't just Jesus. And in fact, um, you heard that sometimes crucifixion, the, the, the act of death took hours, if not days. And do y'all remember how long Jesus was crucified? Time did it start? It started at 9 a.m., right? And at noon, darkness came upon the whole earth, and at 3 o'clock, cried out with a loud voice. Is that right? Yeah, he wasn't on there very long. <laughs> so um, I want you to hold on to that idea because. Um, that's one of the things that I was thinking about. Is it necessary, you know, the way that he died, is that significant? Okay, um, the second reason that crucifixion could be significant, um, number B, is because of the political significance. Like I told you, the Romans used this for a purpose, and one of the most important purposes they did was to, um, to thwart any kind of insurrection, any kind of um, revolutionary who wanted to change the Roman rule or government or empire. Um, and of course, here's Jesus walking around Jerusalem using really provocative language about the destruction of the temple, right? And also of bringing about a new kingdom, ushering in a new kingdom, calling, you know, people are calling him the Messiah, the one who's been anointed um, to, change, to change everything. And so um, because of this, those who belong to kind of a historical Jesus movement um, believe that these these actual acts of Jesus' life uh, worked in concert to um, bring him up for crucifixion. Um, so, so they thought that he was a political insurrectionist. He was a terrorist. <laughs> he needed to be taken care of. Um, so is the crucifixion important for that reason? Perhaps. Um, and, and this actually leads to my, my third view of the crucifixion was important because of his willingness to refuse to engage in violence. Um, so I, I need to just uh, have a little disclaimer here. Um, I was um, I went to seminary at Duke Divinity School, and one of the fame um, the claim to fame of Duke Divinity School is it's uh, a Christ-centered pacifist vision. Um, so they really believe that, that because of Jesus Christ, you're called to a pacifist way of life, to not take up arms. And so uh, we study deeply and greatly from um, a couple of the, the um, scholars today who, who believe in this. Stanley Hauerwas is one of them, if you've heard of him. Um, John Howard Yoder is the other. So this vision is that um, Jesus going to the cross, right? Knowing that he was this kind of bringing on this radical vision of what life should be like, of what we're called to do, of what, the, of what religious authorities were supposed to structure their faith for, of, you know, totally reversing what, what the world saw as the way of living. That this was such a huge threat, and he knew it that the temptation that Jesus had was not to avoid the cross. 
He knew. He knew when you stood up against um, those who are in power, they're going to fight back with power. He knew that, that he was going to probably have to pay the cost. The temptation he had to overcome was to fight back, to take up arms and fight back as some of the other revolutionaries during that time were doing. And instead, refuse to engage in violence, even though he would be um, violently um, put down. So they, um, those who understand this as, as um, part of the reason Jesus was crucified, uh, turn to Matthew 26 and other places, the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And this cup, therefore, is understood. The cup that has the temptation to use violence when violence is being used to thwart you. Okay? Do you get that? If it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Think again. This is about taking up arms, being violent against those who are trying to prevent you from doing what you want or what you're called to do. Verse 42, again, he went away the second time and prayed, my father, this cannot pass. Unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? The hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you're here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. In, in Matthew, his ear stays cut off. It doesn't get glued back on. Um, <laughs> verse 52. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. I think it was significant that he uses the word legions. It is a, it's like saying units, you know, army, it's military. Um, I think the legion is about 6,000 um, um, officers and military people. Verse 54, but how then would the scriptures be fulfilled which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. And then the disciples deserted him and fled. And the scriptures of the prophets speak of a suffering servant, a lamb who goes to the slaughter without fighting. The final reason that I think the crucifixion is um, intriguing, and this is a little odd, and I don't know what else to say about it except it's odd, um, is that I, I think I think, uh, especially with the passion of Christ and that kind of significance in that, of, of the actual uh, physical agony of the Savior, right? Um, I, I actually think that that's been kind of
kind of um, lift it up to a point where uh, we've idolized it. We've made an idol out of the, the, the suffering and the pain and the, and the physical disgust of the crucifixion. And here's why I think that. Nobody else does, but I do. Um, there are a lot of horrible ways to die. In the book of Judges, chapter 19, there's a horrible, horrible, horrible story about a woman who is a concubine, which is a horrible way to live, if you ask me. <laughs> and she goes, and um, she ends up in this city, and, um, and they want to, uh, they, uh, she goes with her master, and they want to attack the master, and the master says, no, no, don't attack me, here, have my concubine. And they take her, and it says in the scriptures, they wantonly rape her. All of them. And then they leave her on the steps. And he comes out, the master the next day, and sees her, trying to get her up, nothing happens. So he throws her on the donkey, goes back home, cuts her up into 12 pieces, and mails her body to all the tribes of, Jer of Israel. I'm sorry, that's a horrible way to die. Lynching is a horrible way to die. Gang rape. Necklacing. You know what necklacing is? Horrible. You take tires and put it around your neck and your body, cover it with petrol, and light you on fire. Burning you at the stake is a horrible way to die. There are horrible ways to be killed in this world. The crucifixion was one of them. And please don't forget, it wasn't just Jesus who was crucified. For me, what that tells me is that the Almighty God, who could have avoided all of this, chose to enter into our pain and suffering. Nothing was going to keep him from doing that. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Our most holy God took on the holy. So, what does the crucifixion tell me about God? I'm on bottom of page three now. Um, third question. Um, first of all, for me, uh, and of course, this is all about me because <laughs> Father Bill gave me permission to talk about me <laughs> and what I thought about things. So, um, what does the crucifixion tell me about God? You know. I want to know who God is, right? I want to know God's character. I want to know how this God works. Um, you know, is, is this a God who, who keeps track of everything, like gets really angry with me when I mess up? Is this a God who, at points, doesn't have time for me, right? And is, 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 puts me in my place? And, or is this a God that, you know, just hangs out and watches everything and, and takes <coughs> hands off? I want to know what the character of this God is. And for me, the greatest revelation of who our God is is found in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because it tells me something about God that otherwise there's no way I could have known. And what I learn about God is that if I want to truly understand the glory of our almighty God, all I do is look to the cross and see what he's willing to do for you and me. There's a reason in the Gospel of John, the word glorify is found 23 times in that Gospel. It's the most of any good Gospel. Um, the next behind it is the Gospel of Luke, and it's only found there nine times. And every single time in the Gospel of John, when he talks about being glorified, right? I mean, doxa, it's the big doxology. It's like, you want to see the Almighty God? It's always, every single time, associated with the crucifixion. You want to see the glory of God? Look at the cross. And 
Now, glory is um, a, it's a central part of the Old Testament um, because it's it's that divine transcendence, right? Where where you can hardly you can hardly witness it. It's so blinding. It's so beautiful. I mean, think think transfiguration, right? You know, the glory of Jesus is revealed, and it's bright and dazzling. So to say that the glory of God is revealed on the cross when Jesus is being killed tells me that what God wants to show us about himself, his own self-revelation, is that he is most present when we're this, the most pain. And I think, I think that's extraordinary because I think we always feel the exact opposite, right? At least I do. I think when I'm struggling and suffering and weak and vulnerable, I do not feel like God's with me. When I'm doing great, right? When everything's working out just the way I expect, that's when God's with me. But the crucifixion teaches me something so different about the character and nature of this God. Because, and now this is point B, because God who is almighty chose weakness, powerlessness, humiliation, lowliness, and failure as his self-revelation, I know that God can be found in these places. See, God will go to the farthest depths to be with us. Right? That's the other thing I know about God in this crucifixion. There's nothing, nothing about my little, miserable, pathetic life that will prevent God from being with us. It's the reason I think that we hear Romans 8 a lot in funerals. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And finally, D. God is not afraid to take on suffering. When I suffer, God suffers. There's um, a fabulous um, X-Files episode. Do you have any X-Files fan? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was an old show. Um, it was these guys, these FBI agents, Mulder and Scully, and they'd go and, and um, look at paranormal activities throughout the United States and figure out what, what was going on. And so there's this one story where they go into this village and, um, and it's, it's, um, it's, you know, it's wonderfully done cinematically. There's this woman who's like on the ground and, and she looks frightened and she looks like she's kind of, you know, been strapped on the ground and, and this creature comes and it looks like she's being sad this ugly, hideous, terrible creature comes and, and kind of descends upon her and the last <coughs> is, is part of the scene that she's screaming. Boy, better police is this. So you see the FBI agents come, right? And the village doesn't say anything. The people in the village don't say a word. But they're really quiet about what's going on here. Well, you fast forward and you find out that this woman who's been sacrificed is now up and about. She's part of the village and she's moving around, and it turns out that the reason that they're being really quiet in this village is that hideous, terrible creature actually eats the illnesses and sicknesses of everybody else and takes it upon him. So it becomes even more hideous, and even more terrible, and his existence is horrid. But it frees him everybody else from the pain. I show this um, X-Files episodes to the teenagers on Holy Week. When I suffer, God's taking on that suffering. Okay, last question. What does Jesus mean when he tells me to take up my cross. Like, what? <laughs> what, is, what is that supposed to mean? So he tells his disciples in Matthew 16, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So um, there, there are what? Three things? Four things? Four things that I learned about this. Number one, 
Following Jesus means there's a good chance I'm going to suffer when I live in a community with disciples of Christ. So um, I found this uh, little gem from a guy named Martin Luther, um, and he wrote about the seven marks of the church. So, so like, the question is, how do you know it's church? How do you know that it's the church of God? And he said, well, you know, where the word is proclaimed, um, rightfully, that's church. Where the sacraments are administered, that's church. And he goes on and on, you know, things that you expect, ordination, blah, blah, blah. The seventh mark of the church, listen to this. The holy Christian people are externally recognized by the holy possession of the sacred cross. They must endure every misfortune and persecution, all kinds of trials and evils from the devil, the world, and the flesh. By inward sadness, timidity, fear, outward poverty, contempt, illness, and weakness in order to become like their head, Christ. And the only reason they must suffer is that they steadfastly adhere to Christ and God's word, enduring this for the sake of Christ. Blessed are you when men persecute you on my account. They must be pious, quiet, obedient, and prepared to serve the government and everybody with life and goods doing no one any harm. Sorry about that. No people on earth have to endure such bitter hate. No one has compassion on them. They are given myrrh and gall to drink when they thirst. And all of this is done not because they are adulterers, murderers, thieves, or rogues, but because they want to have none but Christ and no other God. In other words, when you are Christ in the world, as we are all called to be, the world naturally has a response to that. It crucifies you. And because you are the church, you are naturally called to go where Christ goes. And that is the place of suffering. So I learned from the cross when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, that I'm going to have a life that has some suffering. Yeah? And this is why it's so important to me that we do this together, right? Because I don't want to just suffer all by myself. I need you. I need you. I need your stories about how you're suffering because you are Christ-like in the world. And it fills me with hope and endurance. Yeah? Um... Another word from uh, John Howard Yoder, Politics of Jesus. Jesus was in his divinely mandated prophethood, priesthood, and kinship, the bearer of a new possibility of human, social, and therefore political relationships. His baptism is the inauguration, and his cross is the culmination of that new regime in which his disciples are called to share. Jesus has a call to an ethic marked by the cross, a cross identified as the punishment of a man who threatens society by creating a new kind of community, leading a radically new life. In other words, it's what happens to people who want to live in this new kind of community, where forgiveness, love, and peace reign, where you're called to live with everyone, even the ones whom you hate, where you're called to love everybody, where you're called to lift up the lowly, right, and set those who are bound free. Um, just really quickly, um, because Jesus went to the cross and my own cross, I realized that my suffering is not meaningless, but it's redemptive, and I offer you 1 Peter 4 as, as a wonderful way of remembering that. Um, and, and to me, the last two are really important to me, and I'm sorry I have no time to tell you about them, but um, what I've learned because of the crucifixion, which is like epic failure on part of God, you get that, right? I mean, you know, God could have come down and taken care of everything and opened it all clean and wonderful. Instead, he goes and he gets killed. And I think, oh, failure. That's powerful in a way that people, we forget. So I look at my failure in a completely different way, and I see that as carrying my cross and finally, because of the cross, I know that I can live my life with what is being called a fierce vulnerability. And
and I refused to use power. I like really tried to refuse to use power, and instead I used love and weakness in order to love the power of action. That's my bell, so I gotta go. <laughs> All right, peace be with you. Next week, uh, Father Bill will do God for us.